an easy acronym to remember if something happens during your presentation, say your PowerPoint goes down, there's a car alarm going off, something like that. I use the acronym ATM, first acknowledge it. ATM, acknowledge, take responsibility and move on. I'm Janet Ahmed, host of Hacks and Hobbies podcast and a digital presence advisor at HumbleZone. This episode is brought to you by Home Studio Mastery. I launched a consultation and course program to help podcasters and course creators to create a space in their homes that will reduce the friction of creating content and appearing their best when showing up on camera. The pandemic gave us a lot of issues, but this one is here to stay. We're now so much closer to our audience thanks to video becoming more popular and affordable. I help guide folks who want to create Hollywood-worthy studios to not only capture great content, but also build more confidence, more authority, and be more comfortable in front of the camera. If I can do it, you can too. And with my help, you can do it faster. So if you'd like to learn more, visit homestudiomastery.com and how you too can create a home studio that brings out your personality, professionalism, and possibilities. Thank you for tuning in to Hacks and Hobbies with your host, Junaid. We're visited by our amazing guests coming from all walks of life who want to learn their story, their struggles, and their journey on how they got to where they are today. So stick around. Don shares his incredible journey from being a television producer to performing with the iconic Blue Man Group. Discover the defining moments that shaped his path and how he transformed setbacks into opportunities. Don's passion for engaging with audiences led him to teach public speaking using unique techniques learned from his clowning experiences. Join us as we explore the power of vulnerability, storytelling, and the importance of being of service to your audience. Tune in for an inspiring conversation with Don Colliver that will help you find your true calling and connect with your audience in meaningful ways. Don, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Thanks, Janae. Great, he, great to be here. Awesome, dude. So the way it would go, I'd love to get started from the beginning and learn a little bit about you and how you got here, learn your origin story, I know the journey is long, but there's, I'm sure there's a few stories in there that bring out your essence. So let's jump right in. What's yeah, the one? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, please. What's one of the one defining moments that's been in your life? Oh gosh, defining moment. Boy, oh boy. Ah. Uh... I would have to say the thing that springs to mind is I was fired from the Blue Man Group. Mm. And that was it really something. I'll put mm. it that way. And it there was a but the win is uh I I had gone through some failures before in my life, like I had a rough divorce and that sort of thing. But mm. I had come into my experience with Blue Man and my performance with them and also other kinds of performance. I really had an awesome support system at the time. And also I had a really great mindset. Mm. And so when that setback happened, it hurt a lot. And, but I was really able to, with the help of others, take a moment and think of, okay, what does this mean? What is the plan that the universe or whatever has for me if I take this as, Things are happening exactly how they should be. Yeah. And it put me on the track where I landed. I started, I was like, where else can my skills and talents be of use? I ended up mm -hmm. speaking at cybersecurity conferences. Uh, I ended up teaching at Google, teaching people, increasing their public speaking ability, using mm -hmm. these clown techniques that I'd learned. Yeah and emotional vulnerability and that sort of thing. Although I don't usually say that because it's not sure. a real sexy thing to talk about in business, yeah. <laughs> but it's a great way to engage. It's a great way to persuade. And it was actually a turning point and also a, a win. Man, that's really powerful. So you performed with the Blue Man Group. Are you? And, and those of you that haven't heard of the Blue Man Group, please 
just Google the Blue Man Group and you'll be amazed with the kind of music and the kind of performance they put together. Yeah, I was a Blue Man. I was also a clown for a contemporary circus similar to Cirque du Soleil. I did a North American tour as the primary host clown with a partner for that. And that's my performative training put me into that. But the essence is hyper, hyper audience aware, hyper audience connected, always aware of engagement, increasing engagement. And prior to that, I was a television producer for 20 mm. years in Los Angeles. Prior to that, I was a, a training video producer for automotive companies. But the through line through all of this yeah. is engagement with an audience. I'm pa- I've always been passionate about how do I engage? How do I engage with an audience? And the natural growth is after I did all these things of the, the most out there vulnerable place is being mm. a clown. The taking it all the way around, I eventually ended up on how can I help people engage with each other? How can I train them to engage either in marketing or in their own presentations at work or even in uh, personal conversations? Wow, that that is that is very fascinating. So you started as being somebody who's creating video trainings. And prior to that, was that... In- was that something that you learned in college or is that something that was just fun to, for you to do? Yeah, I went to school in Boston, Boston University. I studied communication, mass communications, PR. I was actually mm-hmm. an advertising major. Mm-hmm. But when I left college, the first job that I could get was in automotive. I'm from Detroit. Mm-hmm. And so it's like a lot of things where you start you, yeah. that's where your network begins. And mm-hmm. that's how I ended up train doing training videos. All right. So communication, training videos, TV producer for many years, and then you joined the Blue Man Group. Oh, Got a well, jump asked. there. It was, yeah. it was a pretty jump. You know, wait, how did you take that left turn? Or was, is it a right turn? We had the opportunity to experience the Blue Man Group back in Vegas, I think almost 20 years ago. And I still have their CD in my car that I play every once in a while because the music that they created, and I always wanted to set up an instrument similar to that with the rubber paddles because that image can never escape my mind. Yeah, yeah. It's the crazy thing is you need to be so fast. I I think it was, I don't know if you're a drummer or your Mm -hmm. audience are drummers, but I think it was a... 160, you had to be able to do a single stroke roll, 160 beats per minute or something. Wow. And so that was prior to performing, I had to go to drum school simply Mm. to learn to drill, to drum fast enough. And I'm not a drummer. So I had to like take that pretty seriously. Wow. Okay. So pretty diverse experience ladder right there. It's a quite windy road for sure. But then I think what's really cool is what you mentioned, you learned a lot and all of those learnings made you to who you are today, where you're teaching people how to speak, how to do public speaking. I'm trying to see where my mind is at because we just jumped right into the defining moment and that was a defining <laughs> moment. And that's the first time I've asked this question because my guest pre- prior said, let me talk about my defining moment. And I was like, this is a good question. As you're going through the different sections or different phases or different chapters in your life, right? You're in corporate, you're in entertainment. What were some of the motivations and inspirations that kept you moving forward and moving you along and saying, okay, this is what I want to do next. This is what I want to do for the next 20 years of my life. It's been a growth, right? I'm sure like you, can you give me the one minute history of Janaid? Like how did you (laughs) end up doing this great podcast? Absolutely. So it all started because I'm a a content creator for ages and ages. And in 2006, seven is when I started blogging and I heard about podcasts. I was like, hey, we want to start a podcast in 2012. We Myself, my brother-in-law, and my cousin, we had a podcast called Still Brewing It. 
we recorded using Hangouts streaming to YouTube. So then we can download the vid, the audio and edit it and put it together. So that was very cumbersome. We ended up with four episodes and because of the time difference and all the things that were going in there, it, it didn't continue. But I still wanted to start a podcast. Now, fast forward to 2018, I was reading the book, Crushing It by Gary Vaynerchuk, and he said, hey, just document your journey. Just document whatever you're doing. And it just so happened that I had just finished my beekeeping course. I was like, hey, I'll, I can document my beekeeping course on a podcast. And I just discovered this app called Anchor.fm that lets you record a podcast on your phone. So I jumped in my car, and my colleague at the time gave me an idea to talk about Queen Bee, which is not Queen Bee as in the bee but Queen Bee as in Beyonce. I'm like, wait, I didn't know Beyonce was Queen Bee. Ah. So that's the first episode, Queen Bee. And I'm talking about how the resemblance of Beyonce and being a Queen Bee and the actual Queen Bee that lives in the hive. So I documented that journey of my me being a, becoming a podcaster, becoming a beekeeper, having all of these hobbies and cycling and video production all through the first year of the podcast. I didn't market it. I just talked to myself in my car and I would just record and post it out. And then I started asking my me, asking myself, I wonder if there's other people crazy enough talking to themselves. Maybe they'll talk to me. So I started pivoted and I started inviting guests to the podcast. So 500 episodes later, I've interviewed over 400 people on the podcast and it's been just amazing journey for me because it made me the storyteller that I wasn't because listening to stories like yours, listening to stories from, from my guests, from all walks of life, the one thing that I found that was persistence and that was continuing was that when you really want to move in a direction that's going to make you successful, you don't know you're going to be successful. You just got to keep doing it the boring part. And then at the end, you're like, oh my God, I've been doing this for 500 episodes. This is crazy. And and when people see that number, they're like, oh my God, you've really put a lot of work into it. So that's, I think that's been my little journey. Wow. Congratulations Thank on you. 500 episodes. That's incredible. <laughs> that's amazing. Appreciate it. And I will say, I can tell you have a video production background because your background is beautiful back <laughs> there and the camera's mm -hmm. perfect. So yeah. Thank you. Cool. So what was it? The question was, what the question was, what kept you motivated and what inspired you to keep going? So you're in the video industry, you're producing television, you're pollu producing television. And then what kept you inspired to come back and do that same thing? And then switch over to say, okay, I want to go join the Blue Man Group. I'm sure there's some learned lessons that we can take away from it. For sure. Yeah, I think, as with all of us, I'm sure you too, it's a progression of self-knowledge uh, mm -hmm. through iterations of things. And for me, the primarily primary shift has been, Brene Brown talks a lot about it, from it is gone from seeking validation, like trying to, I hope these people like me. I hope mm. they like my TV show. I hope they like, like all the focuses out there. And as, and the clowning was really helpful in this because it forces you to make a decision. Like, why are you doing this really? Because when you're out in front of 800 people a night and then you come back to your hotel room and it's, wow, it went well. Why do I feel bad? Like, mm. why is it not there? It really makes you ask why. And once I started realizing that I had learned some things that could really help folks, I realized that being of service is the ultimate motivation. It's the yeah. one perfectly clean motivation if you're really honest. So I guess to answer your question, what has motivated me, it's been, it's shifted from trying to get validation to trying to be of service. And I actually find that's a great tip for speakers. Mm -hmm. If you're nervous or concerned about a presentation, you find yourself, oh my goodness, I hope they like what I have to say. I hope the executives like give me more headcount based upon what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It can be extremely helpful. I know it is for me to shift to a mindset of, 
I have this information they don't have, and I think mm. it will be really of service if I can deliver it to them. I'm yeah. trying to help them, and they will do with it what they will, but yeah. I'm trying to be of service. And I find that being of service can be a great way to calm speakers as well. Man, that is so powerful. I've been hearing this service for some time now serving your audience, serving the people, informing, and you just educating by serving others. And I think there's a lot of power in it because instead of you selling them something, you're serving them with knowledge. And I think that creates that bond that, oh my God, John's just taught me something that I didn't even think about, which has been like lingering right in front of my face this whole time. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So as you're going through the being the public, you're teaching public speaking courses internally at Google and around the world, what are some of the takeaways that your students that are coming in and learning or didn't realize that they, they already had? I'm a whole bunch of them, to be honest, mm -hmm. uh, Janaid, but trying to boil it down to just a couple. I think there's a lot of talk these days about story, storytelling, mm -hmm. right? And especially for technical engineers and things, they're like, I don't know what that means. How, what are you talking about? Story? How, yeah, I get it. Hero's journey. I get it. Star yeah. Wars is a hero's journey. That has nothing to do with my progress report. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But I think a more, digestible way to think about story is if you need to tell about some data or something come up with the why and the why means the pain like what is uh what pain are you avoiding or what pleasure are you achieving through whatever mm -hmm. it is you are discussing yeah. and that can be enough to add what a lot of people call story it's easy to it's called the curse of knowledge. It's easy mm -hmm. to forget that you ever didn't know what you're talking about, but you have to remember your audience doesn't know. Yeah. And it can take some conscious effort to get back to that place. And a short step, shortcut to get back to that place mm. is thinking of the why, remembering the why and elucidating, elucidating it with what is the pain you're avoiding? What is the pleasure or uh, good stuff that you're getting? No, that's really well done. And talking about stories, right? The There's a gentleman that he wrote the book, Story Worthy. And he talks mm -hmm. about how every single movie is based off of a five-minute story. And they did take that five-minute story and they make it into a movie. And he mentioned something about in Jurassic Park. What was the story? The story was how this person didn't know how he could deal with kids or he didn't know that he could relate to kids. But then in the end, it was so easy for him to relate to the kids because now he's saving their lives. So that five minute story is expanded. The dinosaurs and, and the waterfalls and all those things were just added entertainment, but the, the moral of the story is just five minute story that brings that transformation to this person. Totally. And I think, yeah, it's and I think, amazing. Yeah, I think that's what you're mentioning, right? You got to bring that transformation. Why do we care about these numbers? Why do we care about this progress report? What is it going to do for us for the bottom line? And how can you transform that and share it in in the in the, the grand scheme of things? Totally. Yeah. And I was trying to think of basis of your podcast here, Hacks sure. and Hobbies, like I was trying to think of hacks I could give to your audience. And yeah. another one along the lines of thinking of the why for whatever dry thing they feel they need to be presenting. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of talk with Brene Brown and, and buzziness of vulnerability. And again, yeah. people are like vulnerability, I can't be vulnerable in my work. It's like, great, <laughs> that's super dangerous. And I get it. It makes all, all the sense. But there's short a shortcut to vulnerability by doing just what you asked me at the beginning of this podcast, yeah. which is, can you share a difficulty you've had personally and mm -hmm. what you've learned from it? 
Just those yeah. two things, because it. it's vulnerable for a human to share a time in the past they've had trouble. Mm. And it can be dangerous if you can, if you just share the trouble without anything else, that's just yeah. sharing trauma and that gets yeah. yucky. But yeah. if you can share a difficulty and then share how this is what I learned and I've grown from it, mm -hmm. boom, you've got yourself a story and you are considered vulnerable. You can either be, even be considered warm to your yeah. audience by sharing that, but it takes yeah. a little bit of forethought. I love it. And I think the more people practice on telling these stories to themselves or to a closer audience, the better they get at telling these stories. Without a doubt. Yeah, that's a big yeah, yeah. thing I talk about in my book is mm -hmm. can you find a low stakes, regular place where you can speak in front of people? We're yeah. talking Toastmasters, you might mm -hmm. have a spiritual community. A lot of places are eager to have just five minute chat talks yeah. and you can just get up there and experiment with these things. Yeah, I love it. John, thank you so much, man. It's just, this has been very eye opening. It has been very revealing. I love all the things that you shared. Let's take a quick break. And then when we get back, you'll share with us, with the Superpreneurs, three hacks to take with them. I'm Janet Ahmed, host of Hacks and Hobbies podcast and a digital presence advisor at HumbleZone. This episode is brought to you by Home Studio Mastery. I launched a consultation and course program to help podcasters and course creators to create a space in their homes, They'll reduce the friction of creating content and appearing their best when showing up on camera. The pandemic gave us a lot of issues, but this one is here to stay. We're now so much closer to our audience thanks to video becoming more popular and affordable. I help guide folks who want to create Hollywood-worthy studios to not only capture great content, but also build more confidence, more authority, and be more comfortable in front of the camera. If I can do it, you can too. And with my help, you can do it faster. So if you'd like to learn more, visit homestudiomastery.com and how you too can create a home studio that brings out your personality, professionalism, and possibilities. Hey guys, welcome back. We've been talking with Don Colliver here on Hacks and Hobbies. He's a amazing public speaking coach. Do I, do I call you a coach? I don't even know what I call you. Hey guys, I don't know, well, public speaking. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. He teaches pub, popular public speaking courses. Uh, we'll see. Hey guys, welcome back. We've been talking with Don here on the Hacks and Hobbies podcast. He helps people figure out public speaking and he teaches course internally at Google around the world. And he's been professionally speaking for fortune 500 companies, including Adobe, Cisco, and Medtronic. Don, you've got a few hacks for us to share with the superpreneurs on how they could be better public speakers. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to. So try and make the, I'll try and make these quick easily digestible hacks for your audience. So a lot of, I work with a lot of engineers at Google presenting to executives and they're very nervous about being perfect in their presentations. A lot of these folks are non-native speakers. So they're hyper aware of grammar. They want to be perfect in grammar and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. And so being if you aren't ready to handle imperfection, when it comes at you, even if you've rehearsed a million times, it can really mm -hmm. throw you. So it yeah. can be helpful to learn how to deal with imperfection because imperfection in a presentation can counterintuitively get your audience more on your side. It doesn't feel yeah. that way, but it can really do that. And there's studies to back that up, which you can find in my book. I won't get into now. So an easy acronym to remember if something happens during your presentation, say your PowerPoint goes down, there's a car alarm going off, something like that. I use the acronym ATM. First, acknowledge it. ATM, acknowledge, take responsibility, and move on. So acknowledge it means, you know, folks, there's a car alarm going on. It's annoying, but I'm going to move forward anyway. I don't know if you've ever been in a presentation, Janaid, mm -hmm. where... There's something distracting. Everyone knows it, including yeah. the speaker, and they will not acknowledge it no matter yeah. what. 
And that becomes the most distracting thing to me that they won't acknowledge that there's something yeah. going on. It's like the elephant so, in the room. Yes, yes please. You know, there's an elephant in the room. <laughs> please acknowledge it. Yes. But once they do, it gives me permission to forget about it. So mm -hmm. acknowledge it. Secondly, take responsibility, even if it's not your fault. Say, for example, the tech team didn't hook something up. It doesn't buy you anything and it doesn't make you look any better to start blaming while you're up there. Mm -hmm. This is things you can deal with after the fact. In fact, even if it is not your fault, blaming somebody is probably going to diminish how you look in front of the audience. Yeah. I'm more impressed by somebody who just takes it and moves on. He's the person is bigger than this problem. Yeah. So take responsibility. And now lastly, M move on. Just continue on. And advanced level, this is your second hack, ATC, which is acknowledge it, take responsibility, and then convert it into your message. Can you later call back to that thing and integrate it into your message? Say, for example, you want to change some kind of marketing strategy or mm -hmm. a new angle. And there was a car alarm going off earlier in the presentation. You acknowledge it. You took responsibility. You can then call it back. And you know what? This new marketing strategy is going to be like an annoying car alarm for <laughs> our target audience. That's the ninja level of this, if you will. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? I'm going to give you my third no. otherwise. I love it. I love it. So I love the, con the, the converted fact because just recently I watched... Trevor Noah, stand-up comedian. And that's what comedians do, right? They'll bring everything back full circle to the first thing that they started with. And I just loved his transition on how he started with this one word, this German word that his dad taught him. Nobody ever converted this word into the English language. And then towards the end of the, the entire one-hour piece, he goes back and talks about this word and how he's calling it back and bringing it all back. So I think that was, that's a really good one. And you're right. It is a ninja level skill. You've got to, you must have worked really hard on, on all the things that could go wrong to like, how can I convert it? And I think that's something, what's the word? The comedians that are given impromptu, right? Impromptu, not impromptu. There's a word for these impromptu. Improvisation. Comedians. Yes. Improvisation. Improvisation, yes. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, yeah it's improv. I love it. Yeah. Improv, right. uh, And the term is callback. That's the comedy mm. term is doing call a callback. If you yeah. want to get all like inside baseball of comedy. I love but, it. Uh, call yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of comedy, my last hack would be, some of your listeners may have heard of it, the rule of three. I definitely don't recommend to my students or participants in my classes to write jokes, leave those mm -hmm. to the stand up pros. If yeah. that's what you want to do, try out some open mics. That's great. But not the time to experiment with your new jokes if in your important presentation to mm -hmm. executives. But if you do want to add a little levity, you can use what is called the rule of three. And the way this works is you first need to understand what basic why people laugh at comedy and you laugh at comedy because a pattern has been set and then that pattern has been broken or subverted in a surprising way there's a classic mm -hmm. groucho marx joke last night i shot an elephant in my pajamas we have a certain expectation how he got in my pajamas i'll never know we didn't expect that we thought groucho was going to be wearing the pajamas but in fact it was the elephant wearing the pajamas so set up the pattern, break the pattern. So the way to do this in a presentation is a rule of three. The shortest amount of objects to set up and break a pattern is three. So if you have a list of, let's see, I, I really love sweet. I love Reese's Pieces. I love Hershey's Kisses. And occasionally I'll eat a three pound bag of crystallized sugar. Like, you set it up with two, and then you do a very heightened example of the third one. Mm. And you can use this in professional type presentations too. Yeah. So that's the quickest way to get just a little grin. They aren't going to be falling out of their chairs, but it'll sure. add a little levity. Yeah. yeah. And I think what that's doing is when you open on when you're lighter and you're more emotional, I think it it opens them up to take the information with an open mind as opposed to 
being very locked in to know we have to do it this specific way. Totally. And are you aware of the term dad jokes? Do you know what? Oh, dad yes, jokes please. Are? I'm a yeah. dad. Dad of four kids. <laughs> <laughs> because that's actually another way, because if you tell a dad, like a known dad joke in your presentation mm -hmm. or your status report, people aren't laughing at the joke. Right. They're laughing at you taking the hit for yeah. telling a bad joke. And if you can embrace, that's called vulnerability. I'm sorry, I had to say that. People, <laughs> you are inviting your audience in to laugh at you with yourself. You're all yeah. laughing at you. So yeah. then you can get some connection. I love it. I love making some dad jokes, man. I, I would read, I would just read random pages of dad <laughs> jokes just to get my kids to laugh because it's the funnest thing to watch them laugh. Man, I love those three hacks. I've written them down. We're, we're going to have them uh, in the show notes for sure. So guys, those are three hacks. And now we get to jump into the fast track, the rapid fire questions that I love to ask. Fire. I guess. Number one, what is the one hobby that you wish you got into? Juggling. I still can't juggle. Oh, my God. And I'm a clown and clown teacher. I can't juggle. I fail. <laughs> Can you do balloon animals? I, you know what? I did do balloon animals once. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, anybody can do, you can make a dog. It's yeah. not, you just blow it's it up a, and turn it around. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. <laughs> there was one point in my life where I, where I was like, I want to make some balloon animals. So I started watching these YouTube videos. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. All right. Next up. What did you want to be when you were a child? What did I want to be when I was a child? The weird thing is, such a nerd, I wanted to be a programmer. Mm -hmm. This, I, we're maybe, I might be a little older than you. I'm not sure, but yeah. I had an Apple IIe when I was mm -hmm. a kid. Mm -hmm. But before that, I had, this is really dating me, an Odyssey 2 game console. Oh, like, wow. We didn't get the Atari, we got the Odyssey sure. 2, but it had a keyboard. And it had a, a cartridge about mm -hmm. learning to program. And oh. I dinked around with it. And I just think back now, man, if I would have started programming then, can you oh imagine? My God. It's insane. Oh my God. It's yeah. insane. Magnavox made them, huh? Odyssey 2 game yeah. consoles. Yeah. It had a membrane keyboard. That's why we bought it. Because Atari didn't have a keyboard. It, yeah, they didn't have one. I think I played with a Commodore 64. It was my it was my uh, neighbor's, and he let me borrow it. I was like, let me nice. hook it up to a television. We could just do fun stuff. Rocking right, the next, cassette. The cassette I know. Yeah. 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 All right, next question. What is your favorite movie or TV show? Oh, man. I would have to say at this moment, everything, everywhere, all at once. Man, that movie. Oh, my God. That is such a good movie. It's mind-blowing. Yeah, big time. <laughs> to make that movie in that way where, you know, the character's in the same spot and now you're just changing the scene all around her. Just beautiful. Very well done. It was like a fire hose of emotion for me. I was yeah. like, oh, it was so great. <laughs> On that note, what's the, what is, next question, what movie would you choose if you got to play a character in it? Oh my gosh. Movie would I choose if I got to play a character in it? Indiana Jones, probably. Yes. Indiana Jones. I haven't yeah. heard that one in a long time, but so <laughs> I love it. Especially the last one I saw was with the ghost. Was it the ghost protocol or no, ghost protocol was. That's Tom Mission Cruise. Impossible. That's Mission Impossible. Yeah. Now, there's something with a ghost that had to do with, I can't remember. But anyways, that was a good one. I think he's making another one, isn't he? I saw something about that, but there's a new Indiana, a new person that got cast. I don't remember. Oh. oh. Fate of Atlantis was the last one. Or was it? Yeah. Anyways. All right. Next question. Who is your favorite superhero? I thought about it. it's Superman. It's so lame. I know it's not creative, but I don't think, yeah, Superman. I don't think that's lame at all, man. <laughs> Superman is freaking awesome. In fact, I call myself Super Janaid all over the internet. Janaid, I love it. Super Janaid. All right, next up. 
And the last question, if you were a board game, what would it be? Oh, risk. Oh, man. <laughs> That's such a fun game. That's such a fun game. I think it's because, boy, I'm trying to... It's, it can be boring, and it mm -hmm. can take forever. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of how it relates to me. I'm boring. <laughs> it take forever. <laughs> and I'm very strategic. There you go. I love it. That's a nice callback and, and connection there. All right. Thank you so much, Dan, for sharing your wisdom, your stories, your journey, and all the fun things that you love to do. Man, that was so awesome. Where can Thank my you so much, Nate. Yeah, absolutely, man. Where can my superpreneurs find you? Uh, I primarily work on LinkedIn. So just reach out to me at Don Colliver at LinkedIn. And also a bonus, if anybody's interested, anybody wants to work on tightening their engagement with their mm -hmm. audiences, I have a free exercise they can get at doncolliver.com forward slash engage. It's doncolliver.com forward slash engage. You can get yourself uh, an exercise that can get your, basically get your mind off of your slides and your mm -hmm. content and begin to split it between awareness of your audience and of your content at the same time. I love that. Thank you so much, Don. We'll be sure to include all of the links you shared in the episode and the show notes so they can get to the content quickly. All right, thank you so much, Don. Till the next episode, we'll see you later. Thank you for listening to Hacks and Hobbies. You can find additional information on the guest today on the website hacksandhobbies.com. Please feel free to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on upcoming interviews with amazing guests.